So welcome to the Iron Vision webinar and good evening to India and Europe and hello to the United States. First of all, thank you to Iron Vision for hosting this webinar. And I am the moderator of the webinar today and tonight. And our topic today is in-depth looking at the equine corneal ulceration and wound healing. In the next step, I would like to introduce our presenter, Richard McMullen. Uh, and Dr. McMullen is a webinar, uh, is a, sorry, diplomat of American and European College of Veterinary Ophthalmologists. And he's holding the Certificate of Additional Qualification, Zusatzbezeichnung für Augenheilkunde für Pferde. He's Associate Professor at Urban University College of Veterinary Medicine with focus of equine ophthalmology. Furthermore, I would like to give you a short overview of his research interests. This is management of equine uveitis by use of intravitreal injections of gentamicin, management of infectious and immune-mediated keratitis by inducing green photodynamic therapy, equine novel vision testing, testing and streak retinoscopy, and digital infrared imaging. He is also very well known for his focus on equine ophthalmic surgery in standing. And from a personal point of view, he's a great guy for having fun and professional discussions. So Richard, I'm going to let you start and I look forward to the presentation by Richard and questions from all over the world. All right, thank you very much, Sylvia. Uh, let me go ahead and get this screen shared. All right, so we're going to go ahead and, and, and get started. Um, this is going to be um, an attempt to, to kind of cover a, a broad um, range of topics uh, covering corneal ulcers and wound healing um, and try and uh, throw in as many practical um, examples as I can uh, later on as we get going. Of course, uh, initially, we're going to start off, talk a little bit about uh, anatomy. Uh, and then cover, uh, move into uh, the specific diseases uh, following discussion on wound healing. So first and foremost, when we talk about corneal health uh, and corneal anatomy, uh, it's important for us not to forget the precorneal tear film. Uh, the horse has a precorneal tear film of about 240 microliter uh, volume, uh, about 93 micro, micrometers of thickness, and, and it's replaced every seven minutes. And that is uh, an important thing to keep in mind um, because that the turnover of the precorneal tear film, um, not only does it provide uh, nourishment for the cornea and epithelium, uh, removes debris from the corneal surface, it also plays a very important role in, in refraction, uh, which is uh, essential for uh, horses and uh, every other species as well to, to be able to focus images onto the retina, which ultimately provides them with, with clear vision. Uh, in this image, you can see here to the left, this is just an illustration of the precorneal tear film. I just want to point this out to make be a little bit confusing because it kind of looks like a cornea, but this is in fact just the tear film itself. Um, tear film is made up of a lipid layer on the surface um, and a, an aqueous layer below that, sandwiched in between uh, a mucin layer and goblet cells. That mucin layer is uh, has a tight connection uh, in relationship with the corneal epithelial cells. And that'll be important uh, as we move forward, uh, talking about using different staining techniques to evaluate corneal surface diseases. The corneal, uh, the cornea itself, uh, we, we know in domestic animals and the horse is no exception, has uh, made up of four layers. Um, the Corneal thickness overall varies from about uh, three quarters of a millimeter to just over a millimeter thick, depending on the area of the cornea that we're measuring. Um, and we've, we certainly have new information available to us over the last uh, eight to 10 years um, by means of uh, high frequency, or not high frequency ultrasound, but um, and uh, advanced uh, ophthalmic imaging that allows us to see more uh, detail and mat with much higher magnification in the living animal, thus minimizing the artifacts that 
uh, artifactual changes that we see when measuring um, structures uh, in the, for example, the, the cornea uh, as it's been preserved in, in formalin for histopathology, we get a lot of uh, desiccation of the tissue dehydration uh, and we get tissue shrinking and so some of those values are um, for uh, assessing vision and, and refractive uh, refraction and optics can be can be somewhat misleading and, and cause some inaccuracies whereas with uh, in vivo imaging using optical coherence tomography for example which is what this image on the the left um, Sylvia, can you nod if you can see my cursor? Oh yeah, I do. Okay, perfect. Do. Um, and so now this image on the left, you can see is, a, is an, uh, an OCT image or optical coherence tomography. I'm gonna say OCT from now on. If anybody has any questions just, um, or forgets what that is, just let, just let me know. Um, as you can see here, the, this is a representative structure um, that is uh, similar uh, or it's uh, same, uh, orientation as the histopath image. Um, A represents the epithelium, B, the corneal stroma, uh, C, uh, the um, desmase membrane and the posterior endothelium. Those are uh, essentially seen together. While it looks like the endothelium is very easily distinguishable, um, there's a bit of a, uh, an artifactual uh, amplification of that signal at the transition between the cornea and the uh, aqueous humor. And so we get a little bit of a brighter line that gives us an appreciation or, or um, feeling that that tissue is thicker than it actually is. And then D represents the overall corneal thickness. And, and as I mentioned before, that can vary based on the position that we're taking the measurements. The axial cornea is, is thinner overall in general compared to peripheral uh, to the peripheral cornea. Uh, and uh, that will not play as much of a role tonight um, when we talk about that, but it's important to keep that in mind. There's some uh, certainly some things to, to talk about in the horse that are different than other species. Uh, the shape of the of the eye and the shape of the cornea in general uh, is, is, is different. A uh, horse has a, a vertical diameter, corneal diameter of about 23 to 26 millimeters and a horizontal diameter of about 28 to 32 millimeters. Depending on the breed, these can be a little bit higher, larger um, or smaller. Um, and uh, again, as I mentioned before, um, uh, thinner uh, cornea axially, and then in the periphery, we have a thicker, thicker cornea. The stroma is highly organized, uh, and um, the uh, epithelium and endothelium, uh, as with if other species, but because of the large surface area, are certainly subjected to much more uh, constant insult. Uh, from both uh, the anterior chamber as well as from the, uh, the um, external structures, uh, the environment, for example. Uh, one area of weakness is considered, or the limbus uh, is, is considered to be uh, an area of weakness, uh, structural weakness, just because of the transition between the cornea and the sclera, whereby uh, the, the tissue structures are similar just with the sclera having a lot less transparency based on the organization of the the corneal fibers or the or the scleral fibers. Um, this is where uh, stem cells are located and where all the blood vessels from the conjunctiva and the deeper sclera converge um, and essentially sit and wait in a holding pattern. While the vessels in the conjunctiva are there constantly have a, a specific purpose, uh, the deeper vessels um, in a time of uh, injury or insult will uh, receive signals uh, from specific cells within the cornea that will trigger uh, a response uh, to send those blood vessels into the cornea, which we, which we know is neovascularization, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more as we, we move forward. Um, and interestingly enough, and I think uh, uh, probably one of the most interesting talks that I heard in a long time about corneal uh, healing, which she did a much better job than 
uh, and talked about that for a longer duration at this year's uh, ACVO meeting was uh, Sarah Thomasy uh, talked an awful, awful lot about uh, corneal cell migration. And we're just going to touch on that a little bit uh, tonight, but I will show you some, some examples of um, some images of how those cells, or you can actually see how they, they migrate into the cornea in a central petal uh, or central petal uh, pattern. So instead of extending directly uh, in a linear fashion towards the center of the cornea, the, the cells in, just encircle the, the, the cornea and, and form these, these whirls and um, uh, circular swirling patterns. Uh, while the cornea is re-epithelializing. And not only re-epithelializing, but the, as those cells are being replaced. Um, they, those cells then will extend out to reach different areas of the stroma over time, uh, and essentially get pushed closer and closer to the center of the cornea. And of course, this changes a little bit with, with any epithelial damage or, or corneal ulcers. Uh, that, of course, increases the the um, essentially cell drive to that, those areas. Um, but one thing that we know um, is that the first responders in these uh, incidents of corneal injury are uh, polymorphonuclear granulocytes or leukocytes um, that will um, essentially invade the ulcer within hours. And that has some, some consequences as well as uh, both negative and, and positive consequences. And um, there, there's some examples of that as we move forward. And I'll show you the, some of those in, in some pictures. Um, both fibronectin and fibrin play a role in recreating uh, the ulcer or the corneal surface following creation of an ulcer. Um, it's a kind of a quick fix to plug the hole, uh, ensure that the the cornea is protected, decreasing the risk of secondary infection uh, and further destruction. And then a slower response that we have is vascularization of the cornea. Um, a lot of times uh, uh, corneal ulcers, even though they may be quite large, can heal very quickly um, as long as they are not causing any more profound damage. Um, and it's, it's also quite uh, interesting to see how sometimes even when we're performing surgery that will have areas where we uh, can create a large corneal surface ulcer uh, that can heal very quickly, which in a, in a clinical setting or when we're treating infectious disease, we, we can't get that same response. And that's, that's something to struggle with a lot to try and figure out how to make that uh, useful for us in a clinical setting, but we're not there yet. Um, and then we have uh, VEGF and PEDF imbalances that, that can affect vascularization, essentially driving the ingrowth of vessels or preventing their ingrowth um, to uh, accelerate uh, and assist in the healing process. So here are some, some images from uh, a paper uh, by um, Kim et al. Um, from uh, 2018 that very nicely shows uh, this whirling mosaic or pigment whirling um, in corneal healing uh, in, in dogs. And I'll show you some pictures in the horses. We see uh, a similar type response. It's not exactly the same. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with the types of diseases that we see uh, in the way that uh, horses heal differently to dogs. Um, but you can get a very good appreciation here um, in these images to the left where you can see the pigment swirling um, almost like uh, if you were to, to uh, take a look at a cinnamon roll from the, from the top or slice into a, uh, a marmarkuchen, uh, of course, for those of you who have the luxury of eating marmarkuchen, um, and those who we don't, get well, that's too it. bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that swirling pattern is, is very distinctive, and, and it, it really isn't extremely important to know what it means uh, at this stage, but to recognize that um, we actually have uh, essentially some, some evidence of how those cells are migrating around and swirling around the cornea, which is really what the significance of this, these images are at, at this point. Um, and here, these are a couple of images uh, in, in two horses with different types of uh, corneal disease. 
Um, this is uh, on the left. We have a, a horse with um, uh, an ulcerative uh, disease process that is um, slowly uh, healing. You can see it's a chronic disease process. There's lots of vascularization. And then superimposed over that vascularization, you can see that wispy pigment in growth uh, into the axial corneal stroma. And you can see that it's, it's bending as it gets further into the cornea. It's, it's moving around a little bit. So not quite as dramatic as in the images from the dog, but here you can see the same thing, a pigment migration um, as, it, as it moves in towards the center of the cornea, it starts to tend to take on a bit of a curved appearance. Um, these are a couple other examples. Uh, this is a um, uh, very chronic corneal disease that is um, uh, later stage, about three and a half, four months worth of, of healing. You can see the pigment has made, gained uh, access to the axial cornea. Um, not as much of a dramatic um, swirling pattern that you can see here, but it does um, kind of allude to that. And here uh, in this image of uh, horse with um, diffuse corneal edema, um, hobstria, uh, corneal vascularization. This is a horse with, um, with uh, chronic glaucoma. Um, I don't know if you can see that uh, or not. There's a, a shunt tube uh, in the anterior chamber, um, but there you can see that pigment migration um, following ulceration of the cornea after surgery um, that um, led to that, that migration of the pigment. So why is that important that we even talk about that? Well, I think one of the things that um, is important to keep in mind is how these ulcers, not just a pigment deposition and how the cells are, are growing in, but how these ulcers that we have, superficial corneal ulcers, how they heal. What types of pattern are they, are they going to um, heal in? And, and that's helpful to know because it makes it a little bit easier for us to predict how a corneal ulcer should heal. Um, if we have some sort of disruption in the healing pattern, if something is slowed down, it would prevent, um, or we, we don't notice as much uh, dramatic of a healing process, um, then we can see if we can figure out where that might come from. Uh, and as you can see, these illustrations on the, the right, there this, this lesion, if we break this down, we can break it down into convex and concave uh, edges to the, to the lesion. So a convex edge is, is any edge that pushes towards the center of the cornea or the axial part of the cornea. And those concave uh, edges are those that go the furthest away from the cornea. And so the convex edges are going to heal with, with little migration and the concave edges are going to heal with much more cell migration and, and faster, or they will have the appearance of healing faster. The reason for that is, is they're closer to the limbus. So as those cells are not extending radially into the cornea and they're essentially swirling around the edge of the, of the cornea and migrating towards the center, it becomes obvious that those lesions that are furthest away from the axial corner, those are gonna, gonna heal faster. And you can see that in the lower image on the right that um, we have our, our lighter gray area is where that's still uh, ulcerated, no epithelial cells. Um, the dark area are um, normal corneal epithelial cells. And then these um, half shaded or a darker gray in between medium gray uh, shaded areas are cells that have grown in, re-epithelialized the, the ulcer um, and essentially changed the shape of the ulcer, thereby minimizing those concave edges, um, creating new ones, of course, but um, and slowly but surely that, that closes in. So what does this look like in, in practice? Well, here we have a, a large lesion. Um, this is certainly not as... Um, geographically distinct as the, the illustration that I just showed you, but we can, we can see some areas where we've got some, some concave uh, edges uh, more extending out to the periphery of the ulcer. Um, this is day zero. Um, at day two, um, this is uh, an eye that we, we did some debridement on, and so it uh, actually healed quite quickly initially um, re-epithelialized quite fast in the periphery. And as you can see that that oblong shape to the ulcer has now um, in some areas 
uh, become a little bit more defined. There's some, some uh, more obvious tongues of the, the ulcer uh, that are present, and those will continue to get smaller as time goes by. The shape will continue to change. Uh, and remember, this is all going from the periphery, and so most of the healing is going to be uh, in this area along the ventral, um, medial ventral, temporal medial aspect of the ulcer, the superficial part of the ulcer is gonna heal the slowest because that is the furthest away from the limbus. And then at day four, we have this ulcer that's um, healed almost uh, completely. So it can go very quickly. That's not always the way that that goes. This is another uh, corneal ulcer. This is a chronic non-healing ulcer that was debrided um, uh, and uh, the, uh, this was right before uh, or following vertebrament, um, but before a corneal swab was taken uh, to the edge of the cornea and, and smoothed out those, those edges. So this is forcing, it's been placed for, for demonstration purposes. So you can see the edges of the epithelium, those would need to be removed. Um, and then we have a slight bit of uh, hazy stain uptake in the periphery of that ulcer uh, just due to those loose epithelial edges. Um, but this is day zero. Again, just a reminder of how those cells are going to close in on those concave areas um, and, and move in axially. And then after um, about a month, this was a very slow chronic, uh, slow healing ulcer um, that um, did not have surgery. Uh, was just redebrided uh, twice and it's taken a long time to heal. So this was before the horse actually went and had a keratectomy done for uh, the non-healing ulcer. And you can see that there's this Y-shaped lesion uh, or area of stain uptake that's still present, indicating that that lesion has not closed all the way. And after 28 days, um, that, that should have, have, have healed completely already. But this is very characteristic for a non-healing corneal ulcer. Uh, corneal epithelium. So what's special about the corneal epithelium? For uh, a, a tissue layer that is only eight to 10 cell layers thick, it's got a, quite a distinct uh, makeup. So it's made up of superficial squamous cells. Um, and then there's cuboidal wing cells in the middle of the, the epithelium. Um, and then those are supported by basal cells. And they form a basement membrane between the corneal epithelium and the stroma. Um, and uh, in general, without any type of injury or insult, about 15% of the cornea epithelium is replaced daily. So there's a constant cell turnover. So those uh, basal cells uh, transition to uh, cuboidal wing cells, which transition to squamous cells, and then they slough off of the surface of the epithelium. So what are the different types of, of ulcerations that we can see? Um, one, for example, is our corneal abrasions, where we don't have a full thickness defect in the epithelium. So just the superficial or mid, um, uh, middle layer of cells, those cuboidal wing cells, down to that layer, but not down to the basement membrane of the epithelium. Um, and those can be noted as um, this um, diffuse area of fluorescein stain uptake. Um, this is hard to differentiate just in clinical practice. Or do we have an epithelial, full thickness epithelial defect, or are we dealing with an erosion? Um, probably one of the most important things to, to look for in these situations um, using um, direct ophthalmoscope or, or a slit lamp, whatever it is that you're using to examine the cornea, is to use the most magnification, magnification that you can hone in on these areas with positive stain uptake and look for edges. If you have a clear demarcation, uh, a, a step down through the epithelium, uh, you will be able to tell that there's a, a full thickness epithelial ulcer, um, whereas an erosion is gonna have a nice smooth transition to the, the healthy tissue around it. You, you won't have that, that um, uh, stark line of demarcation at the epithelial edge. They can be a little bit tricky. Um, generally speaking, horses with erosive lesions aren't going to be as uh, painful as horses with full thickness uh, epithelial defects. Uh, but then, of course, there's some variation in that as well.
Um, but this is a corneal ab abrasion. Here we've got epithelial cells um, that in their normal thickness, and then we have a, a partial thickness, uh, um, partial loss of, of epithelial tissue. Um, and this is a histological example of, of what that might look like. Um, this stroma is, is quite edematous, which is why you have that, that um, um, almost honeycomb appearance to the structure or, or sponge-like appearance to the cornea. Uh, but I want you to concentrate on the epithelium, uh, which is on the right side of the image here. And you can see that, that gouge in the surface of the epithelium uh, goes down about uh, halfway through the, the epithelium. So the next layer that we're going to talk about is the corneal stroma. Uh, the corneal stroma is made up of uh, different types of chondroitin uh, sulfates. Um, and based on their location uh, within the stroma, um, there are different, uh, or those different chondroitin sulfates are located in different areas within the cornea. And it um, may play an important role in, in um, localization from specific organisms may be attracted to certain types of, of uh, collagen, um, which is uh, what we might be seeing uh, with some fungal diseases where they tend to go deeper into the posterior stroma um, and go towards Desmase membrane. Um, the corneal stroma also contains keratocytes, which are arranged in the lamellar networks uh, throughout the, the cornea. Um, and Whenever there is uh, an injury um, or damage to the cornea that exposes stroma, there's immediately new collagen, um, an extracellular matrix um, produced uh, to plug that hole. When to close the, the wound and recreate a normal corneal surface. And if it's taking place quickly, uh, that's generally not going to be clear cornea. Um, and those keratocytes then become myofibroblasts um, and they are hazy. So the, what we see initially is that there will be new tissue thrown down. Uh, it will recreate or fill that lesion, uh, but it will not be transparent or as transparent as it normally would be. And that will occur over time, uh, but sometimes not completely. And so what does that look like clinically? Well, this is, this is just an, an example uh, of a horse with um, some chronic corneal scarring following surgery. So there's a pretty significant invasive uh, surgical process. It was a uh, procedure was performed in this horse. This horse had a um, desmetacil, um, was treated with a corneal conjunctival transposition. This is a little over two years uh, after surgery. Um, and interestingly enough, you can't see very much of the conjunctival graft portion of the transposed tissue very much at all. The axial cornea is uh, quite hazy, um, but it's uh, not as, as hazy as if it would have had a full thickness or a, a conjunctival graft placed uh, in that area. Um, so there is some transparency there, um, but all this hazy area in the cornea, that's a result of, of scarring. So uh, that corneal tissue has been replaced with, with cells that while they uh, replicate what the corneal tissue should look like, uh, it's hazy. It's not uh, transparent or clear as the uh, original cornea would be. Um, and then there's also some other um, discussion as to um, what benefit or drawback this type of corneal scar will have on long-term outcome for a horse. Uh, and I'll talk about that a lot more towards the tail end of, of the, the presentation uh, when we get to some of the, these, um, looking at some of the uh, progress of the corneal surgical procedures. Um, there's some other changes that take place in the cornea that will lead to haziness, uh, lead to some structural changes in the cornea, um, uh, and these uh, specifically involving fluid migration through and into the cornea. So corneal edema, if we have fluid retention within the stroma, um, and this will uh, may lead to uh, progressive 
corneal edema or chronic corneal edema may lead to uh, bullet formation or epithelial vesicles that form uh, a, as a result of fluid migrating through the cornea. So fluid gains access into the stroma, pushes its way through the corneal stroma, um, and essentially percolates into the epithelium, uh, trapping water with an epithelium leading to these little vesicles. Um, and I'll show you uh, another image of this with a little bit more magnification uh, in a second, but I think we have a question. Sylvia? Oh well, yes, um, Ramani posed a question, why? Um, do we have more fibrosis and scarring in horses when compared to dogs? Yeah, that's a, uh, well, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. Um, it probably has something to do with uh, this, the corneal uh, collagen fibro um, patterns, um, the space between those, those fibrils and the speed in which the corneal uh, or the keratocytes then become uh, myofibroblasts. It, there, that all probably plays a role. Um, I, I, I don't know that we would see that much difference in um, fibrosis formation or scarring if we were to look at a horse with exactly the same lesion as a dog. Um, maybe they wouldn't be as different as we, we think that they are. Um, maybe that has to do with the fact that um, the horses get different types of diseases. They tend to get treated a little bit less frequently early on in many instances because they're not recognized as fast um, or the difficulty in, in, in treating them uh, frequently um, because of their location away from the home. Uh, type of thing. There's probably lots of, of different reasons that play a role there. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, some horses have quite a bit of scarring, whereas others have very little. Uh, and I think that that's something that, that certainly we need to, to put more time yeah. and, and effort into. Uh, at it's this an point. interesting so, issue. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Thank very you. good question. Thank you. All right. So um, I just talked to you about uh, edema and cornea bullae, um, and then I want to show you um, what this looks like clinically. So this is iatrogenic edema. So um, this is edema that I created by putting drugs into the cornea uh, via injection. Uh, and so if you look at the right side of the image, you can see a relatively normal corneal thickness. This is an optical coherence tomography image. Uh, and then over to the left side of the image, you will see a dramatic increase in thickness of the uh, in corneal thickness. The bright white area within the stroma is fluid that has been injected into the cornea. I'm just pointing that out now. So I'm going to run this video um, and you'll be able to see that that change a little bit more dynamically. This is um, um, you can see as it goes from side to side. Uh, in the center of that lesion, it's, it's the most, uh, it's the thickest. And um, that is one of the things that's quite interesting in the horses, their, their corneal thickness can be three times, almost four times as thick as their normal corneal thickness um, with edema or with uh, drugs injected into the cornea. And so they are able to expand quite dramatically uh, and that uh, can lead to some, some really, um, uh, dramatic looking images like the one I just showed you. Uh, and then this is uh, in, an image of uh, corneal bullae. So we've got some anterior stromal edema that has, uh, fluid has continued to migrate through the epithelium and then is trapped on the surface of the epithelium uh, and then forms little blisters along the surface of the epithelium. And those are our corneal bullae. Uh, those can rupture causing um, erosive lesions if they're not full thickness, or they may coalesce, form larger uh, vesicles that when they rupture, expose underlying stroma. And those can be, can be quite painful. Um, leading, leaving the stroma exposed can also uh, predispose those horses to secondary infection. And so it's in, important to monitor those, uh, try and minimize the effects of, of edema as much as we can as well. Um, and this goes back to the question we, we just talked about, um, the collagen disarrangement 
um, leading to, to fibrosis. Um, and it can be often quite pronounced in horses. And, and this is a, a horse that actually had a keratectomy, superficial lamellar keratectomy performed for a um, immune-mediated keratitis that um, healed quite well, but with a, an exaggerated granulation response. And so there's a, a huge influx of, of, um, of vessels into that area and a rapid uh, way down of collagen that is in a completely disarrayed and, and uh, abnormal manner that leads to this very dense uh, area of fibrosis um, raised off of the surface uh, quite often. Um, and then over time that will, will continue to change and remodel. Um, I'll show you some more images of those later. This is uh, just an example I wanted to show you, show you there. Um, and then when we get down to, um, through the stroma, then we get down to the layer of uh, the next layer of the corneal desmase membrane, which is essentially a basement membrane, the corneal endothelium, um, and is about 30, uh, 38, 42 millimeters, uh, sorry, micrometers thick. Um, and if we have clinical exposure, so we have loss of stroma um, and epithelium all the way down to desmase, uh, that is uh, um, known as a desmetaceal. Um, the endothelium, uh, the corneal endothelium is a single layer of cells that is um, very, has a very, very specific uh, purpose in that, in that they um, contain ATPase pumps, um, intracellular ATPase pumps to, to decrease uptake of fluid uh, within the, the cornea. And so they play a very important role in maintaining corneal uh, clarity. Once we have damage to the cornea um, through injury or infection, that can lead to corneal melting or proteolytic breakdown of the corneal stroma. Um, and there's a sequence of events that takes place during injury. And one of the first things that happens is that cytokines are, are released uh, from the damaged cells that cause PMNs or, or leukocytes, granulocytes, to migrate into the lesion. Well, those leukocytes will also um, produce more cytokines. And so with any type of injury that we have, migration of white blood cells into that lesion, the breakdown of tissue in that area um, becomes accelerated. So we have a lesion that occurs, and if it doesn't heal on its own very quickly, then signals are sent out to essentially clear the area. And that's where the white blood cells come in to do. Um, and they help to further damage or fur create further damage to the uh, cells within that ulcer to help rid it of um, invading organisms. They also contain proteases. Um, those proteases will break down corneal stromal uh, collagen as well which is a normal part of the healing process to help digest those damaged cells, um, but will also lead to accelerated loss of stromal tissue uh, in an area or in a lesion that becomes infected or is quite large, um, and which is why it's so important to uh, control the inflammation uh, very early uh, or as early as possible uh, in, these, in these horses. Um, and these keratocytes, that are in that area very rapidly become myofibroblasts. So they will lay down new collagen um, and, and create um, um, essentially replacement tissue. Uh, but again, that is, is very hazy. And while it will um, occur quite quickly, the, the time that it takes for those lesions to then become transparent over time um, is, is quite is quite uh, pronounced. Um, and this is a, an illustration um, that, that shows essentially uh, in, in a, uh, a simplified form of uh, how that healing process takes place. And, and the thing that is important is that we did have two different types of, of, of healing that can take place that we have um, uh, in a regular form of, of healing that which leads to that scar tissue where we have more haze. And this is uh, probably what we encounter in horses uh, much more frequently 
than a controlled um, uh, healing where we have more transparency afterwards. Um, we would like to achieve this, um, but we are certainly not, um, uh, not capable of, of predicting how well that will go in, in most cases now. We're, we're uh, limited in the ability to prevent scarring in, in horses. I think the biggest thing that we can do is, is um, control infection, control inflammation, and, and um, intervene as early as possible. So here's an example of a, of a corneal melt that we, we talked about, proteolytic breakdown of the corneal stroma. Uh, and you can see this, this white waxy, it's almost like melted candle wax appearance of the stroma uh, on the lower eyelid surface. So that tissue from the stroma will actually start to uh, melt. It, it doesn't really melt, but it breaks down its sloughs, um, but that's what it looks like. And then it will drip and, and fall uh, based on gravity uh, towards the, the lower or ventral aspect of the eye. And if it becomes progressive enough, then it will um, uh, extend over the eyelid margin as well. When we have the center of the lesion here, you can see how it's darker. This is not a positive sign. This is a very negative indication uh, that the corneal ulcer has progressed and the breakdown of the collagen has progressed so rapidly that there is, is very little stroma left in that area. And so you have this very thick, uh, hazy donut appearance uh, to the cornea um, that um, many falsely assume means that, oh, this must be relatively normal because I can see through that cornea, uh, but it's quite the opposite. That's actually an a, a indication of corneal thinning. And even if the melting process is controlled with drugs or following um, a combination of surgical debridement and, and medical therapy, where we are still left with a loss of corneal stromal tissue. So this is a desmetacil that is, um, there is no active um, or no visibly active stromal breakdown, proteolytic breakdown of the cornea, no melting, uh, but there is a large desmetacil visible, which is why in the rest of the the cornea, you can't see through it at all because it's edematous. There's a lot of fluid in the cornea. Um, and then in this area specifically, we have no corneal stroma left. It's nothing but desmase membrane and endothelium, which is why it's so clear in this area. And this poses a, uh, a significant challenge uh, in horses because um, the corneal stroma does not grow in to heal these lesions very well. Uh, I'll well, point that out to you as we as we move forward. Um, vascularization can be helpful in in healing lesions uh, in the cornea, um, but they generally grow relatively slowly. Um, not only does it do these the vessels grow slowly, um, it takes quite some time for them to actually be called upon to 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 join in the fight as you. I might say. Um, and so these vessels here are quite profound. They have made it three quarters of the way across the corneal stroma. Um, it generally takes about two weeks, uh, or, or excuse me, about seven days for vessels to actually even start to grow into the cornea. So um, that's kind of one of the reasons why we talk about a seven day rule with ulcers. If you don't have um, positive turnaround or you don't see a positive effect response to your treatment after a week, um, you should start to, to check um, uh, what the underlying cause is, why is the ulcer still present, um, and if necessary, then refer. Uh, because once the vessels start to grow in, while that will help to get things under control, they're, they're growing in for a reason. It means something hasn't uh, allowed the, something's present that hasn't allowed the cornea to heal on its own. And so there's an underlying cause reason for the inflammation of the ulcer to still be present. Uh, and these vessels, when they grow in into a desmetacil, for example, 
uh, even if they reach the edge, they've got no stroma to migrate through. So they'll come to the edge of the lesion uh, and then stop there. So uh, we need to, to use some different um, uh, uh, treatment approaches to, to get them controlled. The vascularization or the speed of vascularization um, and the duration of time that vessels remain in the cornea are quite variable. Um, for horses that have uh, an infectious process where it's uh, kind of um, more or less a straightforward inflammatory and infectious process where um, inflammation occurs based on uh, the infection, the infection is then controlled and then the inflammation subsides and everything disappears. That's, it's a very predictable uh, pattern or approach. But some organisms may decrease the speed in which vessels grow. Um, some um, chronic lesions may lead to vessels remaining uh, in the cornea permanently. They don't re uh, retract ever. Uh, and then surgical intervention can, for example, this horse had a conjunctival graft placed over a deeper corneal lesion that while the graft pedicle has been trimmed, so the source is just left with a, a circular area of conjunctival, a pigmented conjunctiva over the original um, lesion, the, some of the vessels that grew in with or underneath the conjunctival graft at the time of surgery, those remain persistent. Uh, and these, these won't disappear. Those are gonna remain uh, present. Um, and the, as you can see, this vessel is filled. Uh, and so um, just keep in mind that one millimeter of growth a day uh, is, is a, a good rule of thumb, but it's not, uh, that's not the answer to, to every um, disease that we're looking at or every corneal lesions. Uh, sometimes those things will go a little bit faster or slower. And also when we're, with there's uh, severe chronicity, uh, for example, in this case, we have a horse with immune-mediated keratitis that has been going on for, for years. These vessels or vascular trees or branches into the corneal stroma, they extend quite far into the cornea. And with medical management, these vessels may become less obvious and become thinner, but oftentimes they don't disappear. So the horse is left with ghost vessels in the cornea. Um, and then at the, whatever triggers the uh, underlying cause that causes the horse to then go into another cycle of active inflammation, those vessels fill quite rapidly. Um, so then it seems like these have just appeared very, very quickly, but they've actually been there. Uh, and they just, they, they show up um, the inflammation shows up quite dramatically very quickly because of the, the vessels that are already present. The, there's also some, some changes that can take place in the stroma that can be quite confusing uh, when there are large areas of vascularization. This is, a, um, as I mentioned, a horse with immune-mediated keratitis and um, due to the vascularization and, and bifurcation or, or the density of the vessels, oftentimes these deep stromal uh, immune-mediated keratitis horses will have uh, leakage from the vessels that will um, cause um, uh, plasma, other blood products from the vessels to leak into the stroma, causing discoloration around the, the vessels. Um, these can oftentimes be confused with uh, stromal abscesses, depending on the size of the uh, area that's affected. Uh, generally speaking, these horses are not going to be nearly as uncomfortable as a horse with a stromal abscess, so that can, that can be a, a, a helpful uh, uh, indication of which direction the, the corneal disease is, is going in. So with, um, if we have corneal ulcers, either superficial or deep, um, we have kind of a, a standardized approach to uh, managing these uh, diseases. Um, and the first and foremost thing we want to do is, is uh, decrease the, or the microbial load. So sterilize the ulcer surface. Um, inhibit tear foam protease activity, so decrease the breakdown of the stromal collagen 
fibros um, to prevent sloughing, um, reduce corneal edema, um, and that can be done uh, a couple of different ways. Uh, and then many horses with uh, um, uh, deeper uh, corneal ulcers and even some with um, uh, large superficial corneal ulcers will have a secondary uveitic component to the disease uh, that, that we need to address as well. Um, oftentimes that is going to be taken care of when we are um, managing edema uh, and, and trying to sterilize the surface of the cornea because we treat a lot of horses with systemic non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that do a good job of uh, minimizing secondary uveitic um, uh, signs, um, as well as a decrease in corneal edema. And so those horses will, will seem like they don't have as much edema and they don't um, have as much secondary uh, uveitis, but that's probably uh, due to, in many instances, the, the fact that we're using a very potent non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, systemically. Uh, horses that don't receive NSAIDs systemically will often have more pronounced clinical findings uh, and so that's just important to keep in mind. Um, and that we are always going to have to deal with some form of fibrosis. Um, if it is a superficial ulcer that heals clear uh, of its own um, or on, of its own accord very quickly, that uh, fibrosis is going to be less dramatic. The more um, invasive the infection is or more uh, the larger the, the ulcer is, the more tissue that's affected, the more likely we are to have a large corneal scar. Uh, and then down the road, we need to assess um, how that's going to affect the horse. And so this does play a role in um, uh, recommending surgical intervention is, uh, are we going to be able to minimize the effects of, of corneal fibrosis by interacting uh, surgically or interjecting surgically sooner? Uh, or can we safely move forward with medical therapy and medical management uh, to uh, control the disease uh, and, and then deal with uh, uh, fibrosis later on down the road? Sylvia, I see we have a oh, question. Um, thank you, Verena, for another question. Uh, so she wanted to know if when plasma leakage from corneal vessels is present, uh, are you always suspecting EMMK or do you see it with other different types of corneal diseases too? Yeah, that's, a, that's another really good question. So I, I think primarily if um, I see a horse for evaluation and I see that if I'm examining a horse that has not had surgery prior to or not, that's one of the first things I think of is immune-mediated keratitis. We can see that same sort of discoloration of the stroma following surgical intervention. So if we, um, for example, treat a horse with a stromal abscess, um, we do a, a lamellar keratoplasty and cut through some vessels to create the flap to remove the abscess, um, those often will develop the same sort of appearing uh, corneal appearances that uh, I just showed you in the previous image. Obviously, having the horse undergoing surgery, we're going to know that that's associated with the surgery itself. So most of the time, I think it's pretty indicative of, of immune-mediated keratitis, unless there's mechanical insult or surgery involved as well. Okay, thank you for this. I hope that answers the question. If not, yeah, just... Verena, let us know if not. Yeah, for sure. All right, so we talked about the superficial ulceration or abrasions. So these are um, more just some, some illustrations of, of different types of ulcers that we see, superficial corneal ulcer, deep uh, ulcer involving the stroma as well. So the epithelium completely um, uh, penetrated. And then we have stromal loss at various depths. Um, and then once we get down to desmase membrane, that becomes a desmetaseal. If we have penetration through desmase membrane in the endothelium, that leads to a full thickness penetrating injury and, and often and more often than not an iris prolapse. And the iris prolapse is actually the horse's method of, of trying to heal its own corneal laceration or, or perforation um, because that, that uh, iris that comes in and plugs the 
the lesion will provide essentially a scaffold for healing, which is, is missing in the desmetaseal. Um, so here are um, those illustrations that I just showed you are going to be on the left side of the screen and then some examples of what those may look like clinically. Obviously, there's a wide variety of, of uh, variation in uh, ulcers and the way that they can appear, uh, but generally speaking, superficial ulcers are going to have a, a defined edge, uh, forcing stain uptake um, in the stroma, and then depending on the uh, adherence of the per peripheral uh, corneal epithelium, we may see some leakage of uh, fluorescein underneath the edge of the, the ulcer. Now, if you are using dilute fluorescein, um, that you dilute fluorescein with uh, saline um, or um, in, you, you might not see this as, as much if you use a um, higher concentration of, of saline, if you use a fluorescein strip, place that directly onto the cornea. Oftentimes you're going to get more of an exaggerated uh, migration of fluorescein uh, underneath the edges of the epithelium. It does not always mean that you're dealing with a non-healing corneal ulcer. There, there has to be a history of, of those ulcers not healing in a timely manner as well because anytime there's an ulcer, there's damage to the epithelium, there's damage to the basement membrane. That basement membrane damage is going to allow fluorescein to creep underneath it. Doesn't mean that it can't heal, it just means that there's a separation of the epithelium and stroma in those areas. Um, those superficial ulcers um, can heal um, uh, fairly smoothly. One thing to be concerned about is if you see some surface changes on the stroma uh, when these ulcers are healing, um, it may be indicative of secondary, um, uh, secondary infection. Um, it also may be a result of some superficial stroma loss that wasn't obvious uh, initially. Uh, because if, if the anterior stroma is peeled away, it breaks a lot of those collagen fibrils that, that bind the um, uh, stromal cells together that will then leave an irregular surface area that will often have a little bit of a hilly appearance. And this is very typical after uh, keratectomies as well. Um, deeper ulcers um, tend to uh, heal very differently. And so here is a uh, a horse that has uh, injured itself on a uh, sharp structure on a nail or something, uh, gouged its cornea, essentially um, flayed its cornea, uh, almost as if it was trying to do a keratectomy on itself. Um, and uh, the superficial aspect of the cornea is gone. Um, we have some um, melting. Uh, in this area, uh, lots of vessels have grown into that area. And so this is a little bit day, ways down the road. This is uh, about 14 days after the initial injury uh, and the, um, the uh, horses being managed medically is doing fairly well. Uh, we still do have some, some area of concern in this, this part of the cornea. But over time, starts to uh, remodel, um, and then these, this lesion will, will gradually uh, re-epithelialize. Um, one of the things that's it's been very interesting for me since um, we've been using the, the OCT so frequently is that the, the corneal stromal lesions, as if we have lesions with stromal loss, um, they'll re-epithelialize very quickly um, when, they, when they do heal well, and if, they're, if, they, if the healing process proceeds as expected, they do heal quite rapidly. Um, but the epithelium will grow over the defects um, and you're left with what's called a facet. So you have a, a depression in the cornea. Um, and uh, I was always led to understand that the stroma over time would refill and reform that part of the cornea. And what we have uh, been noticing is that it's not what we're, what we're encountering. Uh, what we see is the epithelium will continue to lay down over those lesions. And while you do have some stromal uh, regrowth, most of this, uh, I'd say, fine uh, healing to recreate the corneal surface is done by the epithelium. And so often you'll see an area where there was a stromal loss 
um, and we can tell where that area was, even if the cornea looks very normal. Um, on ophthalmic examination, um, if we look at that horse with the OCT, we can see areas of, of increased epithelial thickening in that area, uh, even despite a lack of uh, um, uh, uh, refractive um, issues. So amotropia, if there's, if there's no um, disruption of, of normal refraction in those areas, it's usually due to the corneal epithelium filling in those defects. Uh, and then over time, as you can see, once that re-epithelializes, that area then slowly will, will heal. We've got a small, tiny area of, of fluorescein stain uptake uh, at the axial tip of the ulcer, but the rest of the lesion is, is re-epithelialized. These vessels um, were driving some of the healing process will slowly regress uh, over time. And so once that re-epithelialization has occurred, uh, then this lesion is, will, will slowly um, remodel uh, over time. And it can take uh, months to do that. Um, but uh, once that horse is re-epithelialized and things have quieted down, that, that essentially is, is out of the woods at that point in time. I guess I should point out too, and you can see down at the limbal aspect of the cornea, you've got pretty significant pigment migration into that area, uh, but it hasn't wandered out further into the cornea, probably because of the uh, fact that that's re-epithelialized and there's, there's nothing driving new um, vascularization response. Uh, with a desmetaseal, uh, again, as I mentioned before, we have complete loss of uh, corneal stroma uh, due to proteolytic breakdown. Um, and then once that tissue is gone, it, it's gone for good. It needs to be replaced. We need to provide some means of support for the cornea um, in order for these lesions uh, to heal. Um, the, the horse itself is very good at creating desmetaceals. Um, but what it's not good of is replacing or good at is replacing this stroma. And so that's where we're, we're kind of at a, at a crux, when to intervene surgically or, or can we continue to treat these medically. Um, generally speaking, desmetaceals are far more challenging to deal with medically than a, an iris prolapse uh, because the, the horse has provided a scaffold. So this is just a different... Um, uh, appreciation of a desmetaseal and the corneal stroma. You'll see in the lead image on the left, this is uh, the relatively normal cornea over in this area. This dark circle that you can see on the right image is the desmetaseal and uh, the green uh, horizontal line as it moves its way vertically up through the image, uh, you will see that represented uh, where that line is will we'll show up on the left side of the screen, just so you can, can follow that. Um, uh, and so there's a very dramatic loss of tissue. Uh, and you can see as, as that uh, cursor passes, oh, sorry, I pushed the wrong button. As the cursor passes up through the desmetaseal, um, there, there is absolutely no corneal stroma left. There's just desmase membrane endothelium. Um, and the thing that's important that I want to point out here is that this, this desmetaseal has been trying to heal itself. And you can see that, uh, recognize that by the epithelium as it's growing down the edges of the stromal ulcer. Uh, the epithelium grows straight down to desmase, but doesn't do anything not trying at all to get across that lesion. And so this is where we, we have a, a huge problem uh, in that this desmetaseal will, may, will remain uh, until we can provide some stabilization to, to that, that horse. The horse provides that stabilization itself when it pushes some iris into those lesions. So desmase membrane ruptures, um, that allows evacuation of the aqueous humor which is then followed by iris. Iris will come and in, in, in many instances, it's the corpora nigra, depending on the localization of the lesion, the corpora nigra will plug that hole uh, and allow essentially a, a sealed lesion to be created. So the corneal also will be present, iris 
will fill that gap and then it will re-epithelialize over the surface. Here you can see that there's vessels that are encircling the stroma. There's still a very bright, mm, I, it's probably, probably shouldn't say bright black spot because it's not a bright black spot, but it's a very obvious um, dark um, amount of tissue within this ulcer. And this is iris, irritable tissue. The problem with this lesion in this particular horse is that while the iris has plugged the hole, um, the perforation and filled this part of the lesion, it is not re-epithelialized. Um, and the fact that it's not re-epithelialized completely, there's still some leakage. There's a, an underlying drive for vascularization, which is why we get the encircling vascularization of the cornea. If this was sealed, if it was no longer leaking, then the epithelium would cover that lesion that would essentially start to integrate the iris into the cornea and, and close off that lesion. So this, this is uh, a horse that um, we would be very well suited um, to, to stain with a uh, high concentration of fluorescein uh, to determine if there was a leak. Uh, that's a, a Seidel test uh, to determine if, if we needed to do something differently. Um, surgical intervention for, for iris prolapses are, are uh, fairly straightforward. They're, these horses generally do quite well with surgical intervention. It's often a, a step that many owners are reluctant to take. Um, and so they can heal with medical therapy as well, um, but they're long. Um, they take a long time to heal and then uh, vision is uh, severely compromised afterwards. Surgery can, can get that turned around quite quickly. This is just an infrared image of the same, same horse. Um, you can see that bluish appearance to the iris that, that we can see in the, the infrared image that just lets us know that there's no tissue covering it. So this has not been re-epithelialized. We already covered these things here again, just wanted to uh, transition into the next set of, of slides here um, with, uh, with proper management, we can prevent secondary infection, uh, and then the ulcers will, will gradually heal um, quite, um, uh, depending on the size and the nature of the ulcer, can, can heal quite, quite, quite regularly. Um, and here we have a, a keratectomy site that is um, about 50% of the way re-epithelialized. You can see that there's a, um, still a geographic area of fluorescein stain uptake, but the majority of the ulcer site has, has re-epithelialized. Uh, Sylvia, we have a question. Okay, we have two other questions. Thank you, Katerina, and thank you, Gabriela. So Katerina, uh, she brought up that um, in perforated eyes where owners decline surgical intervention, uh, would you recommend using atropine for medical treatment or would you be concerned that the defect will up, open up again? So I don't ever have any hesitation using atropine in those horses. Um, and the reason for that is that um, it will help to prevent some of the ciliary spasm in the horse and decrease the discomfort associated with the with the secondary uveitis. Um, the, the fact that there's iris in the, incarcerated in the corneal perforation is going to prevent that iris from opening up again. There, there's not, the, the dilator isn't this overpowering muscle that's going to pull open the, 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 the pupil and then pull that iris out of the corneal lesion. Um, if that were to occur, it would have to be a very small peripheral lesion, probably more than anything else, or, or just the edge of the, the iris was incarcerated uh, in the lesion. Uh, but generally, the benefit of using um, midriatics is much greater than, the, than, than leaving them out. Okay, thank you. Um, and Gabriele wanted to know the picture you showed us before. Um, she saw an abscess just next this to one? the iris mm -hmm. prolapse. Yeah, this one. So this is an abscess, isn't it? Yeah, so that, that actually is, is fibrin uh, in the anterior chamber. Um, 
uh, in, it's uh, pushed up against the corneal stroma. Um, that that is, it w was not in fact an abscess in this horse. It's just a dense amount of fibrin. Uh, but because this lesion was still leaking, uh, it was not sealed. There was uh, constant fibrin production uh, in this eye as well. So that's just a consolidated area of fibrin pushed up against the cornea, trapped between the iris and the stroma. Okay, thank you. Okay, and um, one last note on proteases um, that we do know that um, they, when they are increased uh, due to um, uh, infection, um, uh, white blood cell migration uh, into the, the cornea, um, we have um, some very dramatic changes that take place. Not only visibly, as we can see here with that, that melting corneal ulcer, but we also know that we have uh, the proteoase increases uh, not only in the affected eye, but it also um, increases in the contralateral eye. And I, I apologize, I left off the, this is uh, work done by Frank Olivier and his group at uh, University of Florida uh, some years ago, um, but we have an increase of, of MMP2s um, uh, in the ulcerated eye uh, are quite high, uh, or both MMP2 and MMP9, um, that are uh, very, very high uh, in the affected eye. Uh, and then the levels that the, those proteases are increased in the opposite eye is, is of course, lower, uh, but still um, uh, significant. Uh, not that those lead to any um, lesions in the other eye, but uh, that would be one of those things to, to keep in mind to at least uh, pay attention to what's going on in the horse's opposite eye as well. Um, and then this is just a, a great image of, uh, uh, of rose bangle, because a lot of times people complain about not being able to see rose bangle. If it's there, you can see it. Um, and so just, just keep that in mind. Um, if you have to hunt for it, it might not be there. But if there's a rose bangle positive uh, area of stain uptake, you, you can generally appreciate it. Um, so two stains that we use most commonly are fluorescein. I think everybody um, is, is, that is working with eyes at all is going to be um, uh, uh, not going to be, but, but knows of forcing and has used it. Uh, and it's a very valuable uh, external uh, dye. Um, it stains that expose stroma, it has an affinity to the corneal stroma um, and is intense green stain uptake, which can be enhanced using a cobalt blue filter. Rose bangle, on the other hand, um, will stain both um, the corneal stroma as well as damaged epithelial cells. So as long as there's, um, and it's not so much that the epithelial cell has to be um, uh, severely damaged, but um, the, there has to be enough damage that the uh, microvilli on the surface of the epithelium that interacts with the precorneal tear film, if that is, is disrupted or if the mucin layer of the tear film is, is gone, then that will not prevent uh, rose bangle from gaining access to the cornea. And so we can see rose bangle stain uptake even in lesions where there's not a full thickness epithelial uh, ulcer that there's damage to those epithelial cells. And so that can be quite useful in, um, in finding erosions um, for um, putative viral diseases uh, and also some, some superficial infectious uh, diseases that have not yet uh, become ulcerated, uh, for example, in some uh, examples of superficial keratomycosis. Rose bangle is better evaluated using white light um, and the nice thing about rose bangle and fluorescein is that because uh, rose bangle is a derivative of, of fluorescein or very similar structure to fluorescein, um, you can use them together. You can essentially put them in the eye at the same time, use a cobalt blue filter to evaluate the fluorescein, and then use white light to evaluate rose bangle. And that, that can be quite quite useful. Um, it can often be hard to find the right balance of 
concentration, especially when you take a strip and you apply a, a drop of fluid or you apply the strip to the cornea. And so concentrations can be quite variable. Um, and so uh, that is uh, sometimes uh, more of a challenge, but just know that that is, is possible to do. Um, it, it really is recommended to use fluorescein in any uncomfortable eye that you come across. And uh, uh, we stain everything. So it, it, if, if it even is if it's comfortable, we're still going to use fluorescein because fluorescein tells us an awful lot, um, not just about corneal ulcers, but specifically for corneal ulcers that will help you to um, uh, enhance and improve your observational skills. It'll keep you from missing small ulcers. Um, and you know, there's no, you don't get an award for being able to pick up a, a corneal ulcer without using fluorescein. You don't get any magic brownie points for being able to do that. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're better suited to, to use fluorescein frequently uh, and then rely on what it tells you. Um, very easy to, to detect uh, ulcers. Uh, when you use uh, fluorescein stain. Um, as I mentioned too, cobalt blue filter, which can be found on, on uh, direct ophthalmoscope as well, uh, can aid in, in visualization uh, of, of fluorescein. Um, and just a kind of a side note, um, you, you can get really good uh, pictures with an iPhone or other smartphone um, with, without a flash. Um, with a flash, you can see fluorescein quite well, but without a flash and the cobalt blue filter um, that will uh, help you track the progression of healing quite well. Uh, it doesn't take very much effort at all. Just a direct ophthalmoscope set to a cobalt blue filter and then a, an image without the flash uh, can be quite, quite beneficial. Uh, there's a third stain that, that can be used, and I'm only bringing it up here just because I spent a lot of time playing around with all these different dyes when I was a, a doctoral candidate. Um, and lysamine green um, is thought to be similar uh, in its uh, range of, of, of staining uh, to rose bengal, um, with the exception that it, I don't think it's as, uh, it's as valuable. Uh, rose bengal tends to stain uh, more reproducibly. Uh, than lysamine green. And lysamine green is very difficult to see in the horse's eye because of the, the dark iris in the majority of horses. Of course, there are exceptions, but most horses have a dark iris. And so when you're trying to look for um, a forest green stain on the cornea that doesn't have any uh, autoreflectance, it, it can be a challenge to pick up. And so um, if you're contemplating using it um, as opposed to rose bangle, I would, I would encourage you to, to stick with the rose bangle. Um, dilution can be done. Um, that's, you know, one of those things that uh, there's, you know, reasons to and reasons not to uh, dilute um, stain. You know, what you want to do is not put uh, nine milliliters of fluid in with a, a fluorescein strip and have this really uh, dilute um, uh, amount of stain. Uh, generally, you know, uh, uh, 200 to 300 microliters is, is plenty. Um, and uh, it can be quite beneficial. And most of the time um, we use a dilute um, stain because of uh, convenience, um, but whenever we have something that requires a little bit more uh, intense observation, then we'll, we'll use a, a strip directly as opposed to diluting it. Um, but both have their, have their value. Um, and this is just a, a slide to, to just show there's some, you know, Fluorescein is a very valuable uh, stain and, and can be quite useful. And it, even, you know, all three of these images are here, uh, well, four images, but all of these images that I'm showing you here um, are different to what we have been talking about thus far for using fluorescein to stain the superficial uh, cornea. So uh, Jones test uh, on the left, Left, uh, you see fluorescein uh, has been applied to the cornea and you see it uh, coming out of the nares, uh, uh, the external or distal puncta, and the nares um, will allow you to evaluate the nasolacrimal system, a Cytel test after surgery to determine if a surgical site is um, uh, watertight. Uh, and then uh, this is an example of a Cytel test that is uh, leaking. Uh, there's a corneal injury that's leaking, uh, and you can see that, that um, I always forget how to say that in English, Linzal. Maybe you can help me, Sylvia. Uh, 
What's his lens all? That little uh, trail of tears there. A drainage? Not, maybe drainage? Yeah, that little little uh, little path of, of aqueous <laughs> yeah, that's me. running through the <laughs> forest. Yeah, I make up a whole bunch of words to, to say something close, I hope. But you can see that there's devoid of a forcing stain because the aqueous humor pushes that to the side. And then I see we have some questions. Oh, yeah. Um, so Romani, um, he's, he's, he or she, sorry, um, is suggesting to stain a painful eye um, when, uh, so she would suggest using proparacain to wet the fluorescein stripe. Would you recommend that? Uh, you can. Um, most of the time it's not necessary, um, but that's, there's nothing wrong with, with, with doing that. Okay, and then um, Margie, she wanted, she wanted to know if there is a contraindication to use rose bengal stain after using proparacain on the cornea. Uh, it, not, that I, not that I know of. Um, there may be some epithelial damage that, that's caused by proparacain um, just from the local anesthetic effect um, that can can cause some false stain uptake theoretically. Uh, that's not anything that I've observed. I think more than anything is that um, if we do any staining after um, doing Schirmer tear test evaluation with a, uh, the Schirmer tear strip, uh, sometimes the contact from the strip will leave an erosive area uh, on the cornea. I think that's probably more significant than the propercane or topical anesthetic. Um, but certainly um, that should be something that you are cognizant of when you stain. I think if uh, propericane was causing that much of an issue, we would see that a lot more dramatic, uh, a lot more dramatic stain uptake. It seems to have to have more contact um, and compression than, than just the application of the, the local anesthetic. So I, I, I don't know for sure that it doesn't lead to any uh, uh, inadvertent stain uptake, but it's, uh, it's certainly um, um, uh, my experience is not significant. Okay, thank you. This would be another study. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, and then when we uh, talk about um, the, the corneal health, we, we have to uh, remember uh, corneal microflora. And this is a little bit of a confusing image because this is a, a, a cytology uh, image of cytology has been taken with a tremendous amount of bacteria. This is not what normal corneal microflora looks like. I, I apologize, this is probably a bad use of, of an image. Um, uh, but um, the you know, corneal microflora or the, um, uh, the nasolacrimal conjunctival microflora in the horses have uh, a tremendous amount of, of bacteria and, and fungal organisms that are present majority of those uh, bacterial organisms are gram positive. Um, and then there's a, a variety of fungal organisms that, that are present. And the thing to keep in mind here is that anytime we have uh, an, an ulcer or damage to the cornea, these organisms can invade the cornea. Um, they can cause a, an opportunistic lesion. Um, and if they are um, immune suppression um, is being performed, if a, if a horse is on steroids, for example, or has received steroids, that can exacerbate the uh, secondary uh, or the likelihood of secondary infection from these uh, organisms that are already present. Um, so that, that's important to keep in mind. Um, it's also important to note that with, um, within the normal microbial flora that there's a repopulation that occurs even during treatment, not just after. Um, and that's um, some uh, uh, from a study out of Ohio State back in 2005 that, um, that the micro for, microbial flora can rejuvenate um, and, and essentially um, uh, start to reappear um, during treatment, but can take some time once treatment is, is, is um, stopped but before it's fully back to, to normal. Um, and these horses were looked at after uh, being treated with a variety of um, antibiotics and, and immune suppressive agents for, for two weeks. 
um, in that there's always an increase uh, in, in uh, initial decrease in the, in the in the microbial flora um, that then slowly will, will start to increase even on treatment. And so that, that's Im important to keep in mind so that there's, you know, that initial decrease in, in microbial flora um, can, can have a significant impact on the, on the outcome as we move forward with, with treatment. Um, cytology is, is very important in us to helping to determine how to target uh, the lesions that we're treating. Um, not every ulcer is going to be infected, um, but infected ulcers can have a variety of organisms that are present. And um, it's generally, um, while we have, and have to uh, start palliative treatment to get the disease under control, um, we often do not know what the underlying organism or organisms are that are, that are driving the disease process. And so, uh, cytology um, can be very beneficial as well as cultures and sensitivity to help direct the medical management of diseases, especially uh, in the event that they do not progress the way that we want them to. Um, uh, and it's important that we take uh, scrapings from the, the edge and the base of the ulcer. Um, oftentimes, um, you know, superficial scrapings uh, are going to contain a lot of microflora from the um, the normal conjunctival microflora or uh, debris that's accumulated on the surface and isn't going to necessarily be representative of the lesion itself. And so it's generally beneficial to take two, two stages of, of samples. Um, topical anesthesia is, is our friend. Now there's, you know, maybe some um, disruption uh, in uh, or some decreased ability to identify uh, organisms following uh, topical anesthesia, um, but it's also uh, very uncomfortable for a horse to take a sample without topical anesthesia. Uh, and uh, I think in our, our cases, uh, and uh, in my experience, it's, it's much easier to, to, to get a good sample with the horse uh, being made as comfortable as possible, it tends to give us a better diagnosis as well. Um, and there's a variety of ways to take cytology. You can use a blunt uh, handle end of a scalpel blade, a cyto brush. Um, generally speaking, a cyto brush, a blade, or a Kimura spatula are going to yield better uh, cell samples uh, for cytology than a cotton tip applicator. That would be the the, the last thing I would would use. If that's all you have, then of course that would be uh, helpful. Uh, but can be very, uh, um, you want to get the best sample that you can and have uh, the most opportunity to get a, uh, a good diagnosis. And, and you need that, that tissue sample at the time that you take it. Um, because once you start treatment and start doing things differently, you're going to change the, the, um, your ability to, to, to identify the underlying lesions as you move forward too. So you wanna try and make that count uh, as you can. Um, when we target our, our, our coming up with our treatment plan, um, as I mentioned before, we wanna sterilize the lesion. So we wanna choose antimicrobials based on, on our cytology and, and cultures. Obviously cytology, we're gonna be able to read out uh, quickly. Uh, it can make adjustments very, very fast or even almost instantaneously. Um, and uh, will give us a good idea, are we dealing with a bacterial or a fungal organism, uh, which are, will help us uh, target our treatment. Um, but just keep in mind, even if an ulcer is sterile and you don't identify any organisms, uh, they can still progress. Uh, that, that corneal um, breakdown uh, just based on, on white blood cells can be quite dramatic. And so um, oftentimes uh, sterilization is a first step, uh, but we need to, to manage the inflammation as well, because just because we can eradicate the uh, antibiotic or the microbial organisms that are driving the disease process, they are not the only things contributing to the problems. Uh, we talked a lot about um, white blood cells. These are just, just an example of those in larger magnification. Um, they tend to play a tremendous role in infectious keratitis, especially fungal disease in horses. Um, this is a uh, mid-stromal to deep-stromal uh, corneal ulcer 
that has cellular infiltrate in the periphery of the cornea, some fibrin in the anterior chamber, and there's also hypopion, which is just a settling out of, of white blood cells in the, in the anterior chamber. So this horse not only has significant corneal disease, but also has a, a, a uveitic component that needs to be, be controlled, which makes management uh, even more difficult. And so one of the hallmarks of managing, atropine, or managing uveitis in horses is to, is to use uh, atropine. Um, generally speaking, uh, we can go twice a day with atropine to achieve madriasis. In most cases, that's going to be frequent enough um, once we have madriasis, um, complete madriasis, and we can drop the frequency down to once a day uh, for about a week to 10 days, um, and then stop it uh, if the pupil remains dilated. Um, and then all the while, we're going to monitor the horse for uh, fecal output, water intake. Um, you can feed horses mashes, which can, can help to um, uh, decrease um, secondary impaction. Uh, and then decrease uh, hay, especially if you have the horse stabled. Um, it's, it's interesting that um, we do uh, a majority of our surgeries, ophthalmic surgeries in the horses at Auburn uh, under sedation. We don't take horses to general anesthesia, but maybe once or twice a year anymore, which is kind of a crazy thing, but I'm just gonna leave it there for now. But um, it's uh, the interesting, I think probably one of the most interesting side effects to that is that we very rarely have to deal with horses with secondary colic due to hospitalization, even in horses with abscesses. Um, and so I think that uh, general anesthesia is playing a, a much greater role in, in those horses than, than just atropine, for example. Atropine is a very important drug, but the horses Using it. So use it with caution, but, but use it appropriately. Um, madriasis will not uh, result in, in retinal damage uh, used in the way that we use it uh, unless a horse is stare at the sun, but most of them are smart enough not to do that. Um, the best thing that you can do for a horse with uh, madriasis is to uh, once you've given them atropine, or even if you're using tropicamide, is to, is to have them wearing a, a UV-rated fly mask. Um, that will, will help them. Most of the time, if a horse is going to have to be out in sunlight or go out into bright light, it's going to close its eye as well. And so as long as it has a means of, of getting some shade, um, you don't have to worry about um, tremendous secondary retinal damage just from using um, midriotics. Um, the other interesting thing using uh, with madriasis is that refraction in horses is, is not really altered. They don't have um, the ability to uh, accommodate but much more than a diopter or two. Um, and pre and post uh, madriasis uh, refraction is, is very similar in the horse. They really only change uh, in the time that they are uh, actively dilating. Um, but of course, when we have horses um, on, on um, midriatics, uh, they would generally reduce their workload, uh, but that has more to do with the corneal disease itself than actual madriasis. So I think most of you know if you inadvertently give a horse uh, atropine instead of tropicamide to dilate the pupil for an exam, it's going to stay open for a long period of time. Those horses can still go out and work uh, without any, any uh, apprehension as long as you uh, inform the owner you know, what to expect or if the horse starts to behave a little bit differently. So many of the corneal lesions that we deal with um, are better suited I shouldn't say better suited, Our, um, there's a, a significant indication for surgical intervention in, in many of these cases. And, and I think that's a fine line that we walk a lot of times. Um, you can treat anything medically for a long period of time. And we can have things that seem like they're never going to heal, will heal under medical therapy. That doesn't mean that medical therapy alone is the best approach for those cases. So our goal when selecting surgery should be to decrease the healing period, the time that it takes for that eye to recover and get the horse back into work. And so it becomes a question of, of um, time. How quickly can we get the horse back into doing what it's supposed to be doing and money? How expensive will it be to do surgery? Um, and there's a, 
an important factor that we always consider when we are recommending surgery is, are we going to save the clients any money by doing this? Or is the eye going to heal on its own without us doing it? If it's the latter, then we don't need to go to surgery. But if we're dealing with a medically managing a disease that we know is going to take six weeks to heal or get to a healing point, but we don't know which direction it's going to go, oftentimes surgical intervention earlier is much better because then we can better predict the timeline uh, postoperatively. So um, early intervention is good, but not always, always necessary. Um, and it depends on what is going on with medical therapy. Um, if medical therapy is going well, the eye is healing appropriately, there's no need to intervene with surgical intervention. Um, but there are often times that we do not get the disease under control like we need to. Uh, and so um, using some grafting uh, material, for example, um, is, is, is very, very important, uh, may help to uh, get the whole process under control much, much faster. Um, this is a little bit of, a, of an aside as far as, uh, you know, corneal ulceration. The reason I have squamous cell carcinoma in here is uh, because we, we run into this an awful lot that these lesions, oftentimes horses will lose their eyes for these um, uh, superficial squamous cell lesions uh, affecting the cornea and the conjunctival areas of the uh, cornea and conjunctiva as well as the limbus. Uh, these horses have a, a tremendously positive uh, prognosis following surgery um, with um, adequate surgical resection and secondary adjunctive therapy. And there's many different adjunctive therapies out there. Um, we primarily use uh, photodynamic therapy with uh, endocyanine or infocyanine green, but appropriate surgical uh, removal and secondary uh, adjunctive therapy and treatment of the ulcer is, is a very effective treatment for horses with squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and so I just wanted to, to bring that up because even, even really large areas um, can be uh, surgically debulked um, remember, we're dealing with, you know, a little over a millimeter of tissue in the periphery and uh, squamous cell is fortunately, as you can see here, even after a keratectomy that's, you know, roughly 30% corneal depth, um, there's some healthy stroma on the underside of that uh, neoplastic tissue. Um, and so we can completely remove the tissue and get very good margins uh, within the cornea. Uh, and those, those horses long-term can, can, can do very well. Um, this is just a, a, an example of what the horse would look like with uh, um, uh, endocyanine green or infracyanine green placed on the, on the corneal lesion following uh, the, the keratectomy. Uh, and these are other types of adjunctive therapy. This is a CO2 laser ablation of the keratectomy site. So following the keratectomy, uh, this would be another appropriate means of treating that instead of placing dye on the cornea. We'd use a CO2 laser and ablate all of this tissue. Very effective treatment does lead to some granulation tissue, but to be perfectly honest with you, if you treat squamous cell carcinoma, you had better learn to befriend granulation tissue because there's no magic way to avoid it, um, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, and the, the, probably the biggest downside with uh, CO2 laser ablation is that um, with the laser energy, you're actually applying uh, heat and laser energy directly to the cornea and you're changing the, the superficial structure of the cornea and it causes uh, essentially retraction of tissue and contraction of tissue that permanently changes the curvature of the cornea. So you change the refraction permanently um, following CO2 laser ablation. Still an effective means of, of treating squamous cell carcinoma, uh, but you do have uh, those refractive changes. Uh, Sylvia, I see that we have a question. Oh yes, we have uh, actually two question. uh, questions. Ramani, so he is um, interested in uh, the topic we had before. So um, considering the tear flow dynamics in horses, uh, do you recommend use the use of punctum plugs to increase antibiotic concentration? Uh, I, I have never used them, 
So I, I really don't have any qualified answer to give there. Um, it certainly would seem like that uh, they could be beneficial um, in the instance where you have decreased tear film production um, and you want to increase contact time. I think probably one of the problems is if we don't have a decrease in tear film production and you use punctal plugs, then you will have an overflow of the, um, the lacrimal lake uh, and then your drugs are, are going to overflow uh, the, the lid margin as opposed to being uh, remaining in contact longer with the cornea. Th that would just be my assessment. I, I don't know. That would be something that would be very worthwhile to look into, though. Okay, um, thank you for that. And Richard, I have two questions referring to um, the difference in uh, photodynamic therapy uh, do you see any differences in the deep stromal forms of uh, squamous cal cell carcinomas um, and uh, the superficial ones? Do you see any difference in the outcome with photodynamic therapy? I, I think it's a little difficult to make a very qualified, uh, to give you a qualified answer for that because we don't see very many deep or um, progressive uh, okay. squamous cell carcinoma. We see them occasionally or have them referred after they've been treated uh, several times in the past, um, and then they become invasive. Um, and so far, the ones that we've treated have done well, but I don't know, um, comparatively speaking, superficial um, squamous cell carcinoma respond very favorably to the treatment. Um, it's generally a one-time treatment. Um, and we've had that same experience with the more invasive lesions, but I would be very skeptical in saying that um, we don't have enough of those with long-term follow-up to know if they're going to recur at any greater rate than, than the superficial lesions would. Okay, um, thank you for that. And um, referring the CO2 laser, did you see any endothelium damage so far? Are there any uh, so I. I, I, I don't know. Um, and the main reason that I say that is most of the cornea in those areas that you treat will have some significant fibrosis to them. Um, and I haven't used a CO2 laser to treat squamous cell carcinoma for at least 10, 11 years. And so I, I have not had the ability to look at any of those with OCT or anything like that. So I, 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 I don't know. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the questions. Um, and so the lesion, I'll jump from the CO2 laser to these little wet sponges on the surface of the cornea. These are um, essentially um, wet cells soaked in mitomycin. When we first started to do use mitomycin to treat um, squamous cell carcinoma, uh, corneal squamous cell carcinoma, uh, in horses, we treated them with a, a higher concentration of 0.4% concentration um, intraoperatively, and then um, treated them with a 0.04% uh, concentration three times a day uh, for seven days, week on, week off uh, for three cycles. Um, mitomycin C can lead to um, a sterile stromal melts, uh, and if unobserved, can uh, eat right through the cornea like uh, putting a hot spoon on ice cream, it'll go right through it. And the interesting thing is the horses aren't really uncomfortable and um, the advantage, or I guess there's no advantage in stromal melt, but the positive aspect of that is, is if you see it and you stop the mitomycin therapy, it's, it, you pretty much eliminate the melt. The problem is, is that um, in many instances, and in, uh, especially in the States, not so much when I was working in Germany, but um, we would send horses home with mitomycin. And so it became a little bit dangerous um, with a higher concentration of the drug or because they've had that high concentration. Uh, we usually don't even start mitomycin therapy until the corneas have re-epithelialized. Then once they've re-epithelialized, then institute the mitomycin therapy at the lower concentration. And, um, and that is shown to be just as effective as 
as uh, using the topical application at the time of surgery. Uh, and you can uh, almost completely eliminate the, the risk of, of uh, having a melt like that uh, afterwards. Um, uh, additional therapy for squamous cell carcinoma uh, may include uh, conjunctival or uh, amnion grafts. Um, we tend to leave ours open um, and then following photodynamic therapy, they actually heal uh, quite rapidly. Um, but uh, amnion or conjunctiva can also fill in that gap. Um, the uh, downside with um, the any type of graft is that you are having to place sutures into a cornea where you just remove neoplastic tissue. And so if you don't have appropriate tissue margins, you, you may end up seeding um, neoplastic cells deeper into uh, corneal tissue samples. And this is a, a horse that was treated uh, in Florida um, uh, uh, when Frank Olivia was a resident um, with um, uh, squamous cell carcinoma and amnion. Um, and you can see that the long-term effects for this horse, that the horse did great, has some vascularization of the cornea um, uh, and some mild fibrosis of the cornea. And so, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways to treat things. Um, and so one way is not necessarily better than the other. Um, there are just a lot of different ways to do that. Yes, Sylvia. So we have a long question now. Um, it's uh, Mr. Foot. Um, I can't see the... Uh, the four names, so I, I can't really miss the food. Um, here's a clinical case questions, uh, and uh, so he did a he did surgery in uh, a corneal limbus squamous cell carcinoma case, and uh, this it's one covered. Bit, so very real quick. Oh. So why why don't we save this one till the end? Because okay, if we yeah, if we're gonna do, do a case discussion or, yeah. or have some questions that are a little bit take a little yeah, bit more good time. Good idea. Let's, yeah, you're Let's right. take that one at the yeah. end just in case. So we will do it. We'll get back to it. Though, I promise. Okay. All right. And so um, other types of, of corneal diseases that we commonly encounter are non-healing corneal ulcers, ulcers in, in horses. Um, if they are non-responsive to medical therapy, we generally have a, a kind of a straightforward process. Um, we debride the eyes using cotton tip applicator or uh, burr, mechanical burr debridement, um, plus or minus a contact lens um, to uh, protect the corneal surface, keep the horses comfortable. Um, there are still lots of people that, that do uh, grid keratotomies, um, but there's such an a, a increased risk of secondary disease with those um, that if you're inadvertently doing a grid into an infectious corneal ulcer, that can turn into a nightmare. Um, you're much better off using a, a burr, um, mechanical burr debridement than you would be for a, a grid. Um, and then uh, for those that don't respond to uh, the debridement or medical therapy alone, um, then superficial lamellar keratom keratectomies um, are, are often curative. Uh, once you can remove that damaged um, uh, basement membrane uh, epithelial complex um, that allow healthy epithelium to grow in and cover the stroma uh, can, can recreate those, those bonds and, and get rid of the, the recurrent ulcer. Um, grafts, um, can be beneficial in, in these horses as well, um, are often not necessary, but uh, can, can be utilized as well. Um, melting corneal ulcers can, can provide a bit more of a challenge uh, because of the infectious underlying cause uh, in many cases. So you've got uh, proteolytic uh, stromal breakdown, have to get rid of the the organisms before we can do any grafting. And, and oftentimes um, it's a, a bit of a, a balance, uh, how much tissue to remove before we place a graft um, and is the graft and medical therapy going to be enough to prevent um, secondary erosion or, or infiltration or infection of the graft and material itself. Um, and so um, you can use conjunctiva or amnion for, for both of these um, and both of them are, are more or less effective Initially, the scar tissue, or I shouldn't say scar tissue, the, the visual field deficit is very similar uh, in both conjunctival and, and amniotic gram, uh, membrane graph placement. Uh, but over time, the amnion will become clearer. Um, amnion also has a benefit of uh, being a self-sacrificing graft. Uh, I have to steal that from, from Dennis. Des Brooks was when you say that all the time, and I think it 
just really describes very well how Amnion works for us. It goes in, you put it there, and then um, uh, it does it, it. It sticks around for a couple of weeks, and 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 then um, disappears and sloughs off. Sometimes they'll be integrated. I think probably the biggest challenge with amnion grafts is uh, the sutures that we have to use to place them uh, stay in the cornea much longer than the graft itself. And so um, that's uh, something we, we need to work on, but a very effective way to, to treat um, uh, non-hailing ulcers or, or other large areas of ulceration in the cornea without using conjunctiva. Desmetaceles can benefit uh, greatly from, from amnion as well. And they, they also, because it's a foreign material, they um, also provide a, li a little bit of a protective layer, more so than conjunctiva will. Conjunctiva from the horse is going to be more sensitive um, than, than the amnion will, and so they often are a little bit more comfortable with the amnion as well, but that's, that's a, a subjective observation. Uh, superficial keratomycosis um, can, can go very well or very poorly. Um, often, uh, in the same horse, um, and uh, regard, regardless of, of what medical or surgical intervention we, we choose, uh, these can be very challenging courses uh, uh, or cases to, to handle uh, as well. Um, uh, but if they respond well with uh, medical therapy and, and just need some tectonic support, amnion um, is quite beneficial. Uh, it often won't stop the infection, but will allow organisms to accumulate in the amnion. And then when the amnion is sloughed, it can and secondarily help decrease the load. Um, and then long-term uh, amnion has a, a lot less uh, fibrosis associated with it than, than conjunctiva. Um, not really quite sure what long-term effect that has on vision down the road though, but that's a topic for another day. Um, this is a, a horse with multifocal desmetaceles, um, one very large lesion, um, and then multiple areas of, of stromal loss within that area. Um, this is a horse that received an amnion graft um, that was that used uh, fresh amnion uh, at the time. Had a horse that had uh, just given birth to a foal. Our pharmacist collected the amnion for us, and we were able to use this uh, in, that, in that horse. And uh, this horse did, did, did very well, responded well, and uh, over time started to, to granulate in. I don't have any good long-term um, images, follow-up images, but uh, the owner has, has sent some, some uh, follow-up images uh, to, to the service um, down the road and, and uh, that horse has cleared up quite dramatically. This is relatively shortly after surgery. This is only about five weeks out. Uh, sometimes a conjunctival graft is, is what you have at your disposal to use for a desmetaceal. Um, obviously the size of the lesion is going to, to make those more or less favorable. Um, a large conjunctival graft such as this size um, may seem debilitating. Uh, the interesting thing about this is, is that these horses can still function um, somewhat uh, with a graft that's this large. Have to remember that down the road, this graft isn't going to be nearly as engorged or as large as this one is. It will consolidate around the, the surgical site. And um, once that is healed, um, if you elect to trim the pedicle, uh, you might actually get that to become quite thin. But the, the thing that's interesting is the peripheral corneo is going to allow some, some light to pass through it. And because these, these eyes generally are not, the posterior segment is not affected and the retina functions fine, um, the horse has the ability to see normally. So they have pretty significant visual field losses, but the vision that they have is, is decent. Um, and so it becomes a, a bit of a challenge to, to know how well a horse is going to do or not. Uh, and this is, this is uh, the, that same horse a little bit further down the road. You can see that there's some, some uh, uh, bit of a, um, quite a bit of the pupil visible uh, behind that graft. Uh, and that horse actually did quite well. Obviously, it has some visual field. Uh, restrictions, um, but it certainly kept its eye and has some vision on that side. Uh, I'm going to show you a few, um, just a, a few examples of some uh, more advanced corneal surgical procedures. This is a, a DLEK or a deep lamellar endothelial keratoplasty, uh, where there's a superficial graft. 
um, created that corneal tissues folded back. Um, the uh, abscess is punched out using a, a single uh, step or a multi-step uh, approach. Um, and then a smaller graft is placed over the, the lesion to create a watertight seal. And then the uh, original corneal flap is laid down uh, and then sutured along the limbus. The uh, advantage here is access. You can access the, the deeper part of the, the cornea well where the abscess is to remove it um, with the, um, that large graft being created. Downside is that we have to separate a lot of normal stromal tissue. And so immediately following surgery or in the immediate time frame after surgery or in the short period after surgery, uh, there can be quite a bit of fibrosis. Um, this is six weeks post-op, um, pretty dramatic for a lesion that's about six to eight millimeters in diameter in this case. Um, but as you can see down the road, that tends to clear dramatically. Um, and so uh, overall, this gives us a, a really good uh, approach, um, surgical approach. Um, and we can see that over time, these, these lesions will continue to remodel. Uh, this is a PLK, which is a posterior lamellar keratoplasty, essentially a similar principle to the DLEK, except on a smaller scale. Instead of doing a limbal incision, uh, we just make a little trapdoor uh, graft around the abscess uh, and then approach it the same way. Um, this is four months postoperatively. Um, this deeper uh, tissue replacement or the graft that was used to replace the abscess uh, was a biosis, so a porcine subucosal graft. Um, that led to some uh, chronic edema that resolved uh, over time. And this is a little over a year. Um, we have uh, some, some significant uh, clearing of the corneal stroma in that area. One of the things that we're interested in looking at and what we're currently um, starting to look into more is what effect do these surgeries have on postoperative refraction? Uh, and hopefully we'll have some, some more information on that down the road. Anecdotally, we know that um, regardless of what kind of corneal surgeries we do with the exception of uh, keratectomies, um, anytime we put any suture into the cornea, we tend to have some refractive changes that, that, are, um, that are permanent, um, depending on the type of uh, surgery, the location within the cornea and the number of suture and size of suture used. Uh, can have more or less of a, an effect. Um, so this is a, a horse that developed um, endothelial or desmase detachment or uh, focal rupture uh, several years after uh, corneal surgery. Um, the reason for that development is unknown, but here you can see in the sample, this horse underwent a full thickness penetrating keratoplasty uh, with a clear corneal transplant, um, so no conjunctival graft was placed over the lesion. Um, uh, and you can see that um, this is the surgical tissue or the tissue was removed where the damage had occurred. We've got desmetization, um, uh, regrowth of desmase membrane across the lesion, but we can see the original break as well. Um, and this is just intraoperative uh, images of that, that same horse. Um, this is two months postoperatively. So we've got a little bit of fibrosis around the edge of the lesion, vessels growing in up to the, the surgical site, um, but remains relatively clear. Uh, and this is 16 months postoperatively. Um, the owners were ecstatic. Uh, the horse was doing fine, was able to, to continue uh, work as it had prior to, to surgery. Um, and, and everything looked great clinically. I think this is a very satisfying result. If I just look at the appearance of the cornea, um, sure, we have a circular ring of fibrosis. Um, the, the bigger problem is, is that we've got um, uh, uh, essentially two diopters of hyperopia in the surgical eye. Um, compared to um, the uh, minus 0.25 diopters in the, in the normal eye. So a difference in refraction uh, in those eyes of, of two diopters, and that's, that's pretty significant. The horse didn't really demonstrate any signs of having any visual problems, but nevertheless, this, this uh, could certainly affect the horse. Sylvia, I see we have a question. 
Yeah, your money was posing another question. He's asking if OCT uh, for you is the best way to assess DLEK or is just a scan helpful enough? Um, so I can answer recommend? that. So it, not everybody has access to OCT. Yeah, that's um, and problem. so that, that's the problem. Um, mm. For me, uh, it is the, the greatest thing that's ever been invented. Um, I couldn't live with my, out with my OCT. I don't want to live without my OCT. And uh, <laughs> I, um, I, I, I think if I, I would do anything I could, if I had to give up my slit lamp, I could do that, but I don't want to leave my OCT uh, at the side of the road. Um, it's a phenomenal way to evaluate uh, cornea. Um, there are limitations, of course. Um, and so um, if the cornea is very cloudy or severely edematous, then the visualization is limited. Post-operatively for cases like this, it's, it's phenomenal uh, because you can get a much better appreciation of what's going on in the cornea. Uh, and sometimes we'll see things that look like they're in the cornea that are actually not in there. Um, that because of the damage that's occurred in the cornea, that, that things are projected into the cornea on slip lamp, slip lamp evaluation that we can, can clarify pretty easily with the OCT. And I, I'm just going to check, yes, this is actually that horse. So um, everything looked great. If I was looking at this with my five years ago eyes, I would be extremely happy with how this horse looked. I might be a little bit upset about the refraction, um, but then we looked at an OCT um, and then you can see all the damage that has occurred from surgery. Um, granted, the horse has an eye. Um, it might not have that if we hadn't done surgery, but there's pretty significant retrocorneal membrane. There's tension on the cornea. Uh, and so I think there's lots of ways that we can improve post-operative outcomes um, if we can, can manage our surgical approaches. Um, this is uh, an image of the periphery of the lesion. So um, if you imagine the, the surgical site, the circle, this is on the, on the outer edge of that. I'm not sure if it's medial or temporal, it doesn't matter. Um, but you can see where the incision was made you see this depression in the stroma and this thickening of the epithelium. That's what I mentioned uh, earlier on is that the epithelium will fill in these gaps. So we have a nice smooth epithelial surface, but in an area where there's stromal loss. Um, and then Desmase um, in this area never reattached. It never fused with itself, but it fibrosed around it. Uh, and so here you can just see the peripheral edge of the lesion as well. In some areas, there's more separation and there's some overlap, but it gives us a much better appreciation of what this cornea actually looks like after surgery, um, as opposed to just looking at it with a, with a slit lamp. Um, Desmetaceles, iris prolapses, um, as long as we can place corneal tissue or uh, grafting tissue into the lesion and, and, and close off the lesion and create a watertight seal. Those horses do pretty well. I already showed you this image earlier, so I'm gonna skip over that. But this is that same, I shouldn't do that. I'm gonna show it to you again, sorry. We're gonna look at it again because I want you to just have that image fresh in your mind. Um, that's a desmetaceal. And then this is the same horse um, uh, with a desmetaceal, not the one with the iris prolapse, but this horse with desmetaceal following amnion membrane placement in that desmetaceal uh, sutured in place. And then here you can see the irregularity within the cornea, but we've got re-epithelialization over that lesion uh, almost completely. There's a little vacuole in this area, but healing very nicely. Um, and then corneal conjunctival transposition uh, can be very useful for treating some um, uh, desmetaceals, uh, stromal abscesses that don't go full thickness, or, or even iris prolapses in, in many instances. And I think the advantage of corneal transposition, corneal conjunctival transpositions, in, in my experience or in my thoughts, is that we're using all of the horse's uh, own tissue. So we're not having to deal with uh, um, rejection reactions with the exception of uh, suture material. And so that can be quite beneficial. Um, this is a Martinez corneal dissector um, used, being used to 
to undermine the corneal stroma. Um, and then I just want to show you this because this is a fascinating image to look at. So this is a horse that's having a keratectomy done with that same instrument. So we've got, this is an example of a non-healing corneal ulcer. Um, and then we've got a little bit of fibrosis, some uh, change within the anterior stroma. And then here you'll see this white bright line. I want you to focus on this area when the video starts to go. And so what you're seeing is the Martinez corneal dissector coming towards you. Um, and so that is actually causing separation between those lamellae um, and, and is able to, to essentially undermine tissue that we want to remove. Um, and that's what's, what's being performed in, in that previous uh, clinical image. And then that, that corneal conjunctival graft is, is slid up into the uh, area sutured in place. Uh, and then down the road, these will become, uh, these will heal nicely. Um, and, and in many instances, sometimes we have to replace some sutures, but they tend to, um, to uh, fibrose in quite nicely. Uh, and I showed you that one earlier uh, at, at, you know, two years out. Um, they, they remodel as well, but there's always going to be some corneal scarring. And um, I think this is probably one of the things I'm most excited about at the moment. I'm just going to leave you with this. Um, is that this is a focal desmoid membrane rupture led to a chronic stromal ulcer um, that was, wouldn't heal with medical therapy, continued to progress, and then we identified a break in desmase, um, and then we used uh, infracyanine green injected at the junction between the posterior stroma and the desmase membrane, uh, treat it with uh, uh, infrared light or radiation using that 810 nanometer um, uh, diode laser to activate the dye, which causes tissue fusion uh, in that layer. Uh, and that leads to, this is just the um, dye being injected or the injection sites with the dye. You can see those uh, areas of angled areas and then loss of signal um, at the left side of the screen. That's where the dye is in the cornea. There's not loss of tissue there. It's just infrared um, dye that absorbs light. So it prevents us from being able to visualize that. And that leads to fusion of that tissue, seals the rupture and desmase membrane, prevents further ulceration, um, and then allows that ulcer to heal. The really nice part about that is that we don't have any change in refraction down the road because we're not placing any sutures in the cornea and causing any tension, uh, tension changes in the cornea. Uh, these heal quite nicely. So this is something I'm very excited about moving forward. Uh, and this is uh, an OCT image a year after that procedure was done. And you'll notice in this image, you can see um, stromal indentation, um, thickening of the epithelium, which is indicative of previous stromal loss, and then fibrosis around the area where there's a break in desmase here, which essentially led to um, the prevention of, of aqueous humor gaining access to the stromal material. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I see you, Sylvia. I'm gonna go ahead and just finish up here before we get to that question, just because we're we're done that way. We can, we can at least finish up with the presentation in case anybody okay, wanted to. <laughs> On anybody wanted to, to leave. But um, uh, so in conclusion, uh, corneal ulcers um, are present in many different ways. Uh, they, it can be very complicated in trying to assess wound healing. And so um, if there, one thing that we need to be cognizant of is how the cornea heals and recognize when healing is actually taking place or if there's a disruption in that normal healing pattern. Um, initial medical therapy is always indicated and often it's going to be um, uh, um, uh, palliative uh, until we can determine what the underlying cause is, uh, but then know when is appropriate to, to intervene surgically. Um, and using uh, the progression of the lesion, uh, how well the lesion is healing uh, under treatment uh, is, is absolutely imperative. Um, and the earlier we can intervene, the better, be it with medical therapy or, or surgery. Uh, and I, I think probably one of the things that's uh, most exciting in, for, for us in this day and age is that, that we are becoming spoiled with a, a high level of success uh, with treatment. 
And so a lot of things that we do can be successful. Uh, and so um, another thing that I learned from Dennis is never give up. Uh, you can't be the one to give up on your patients. You know, if a, if a client wants to give up, that's one thing. But as long as they're willing to fight, we have to be there for them. Uh, and and I'll, I'll end on that. So we can go ahead and go back to some of those questions that we missed if we. Um, okay, so um, yeah, Javier, I hope I, um, uh, I, I speak this in the way it should be. He is asking uh, if you would recommend corn and cross-linking in any of these cases. Uh, sure. Um, there certainly uh, is an indication for corneal cross-linking. Um, I actually have thought about corneal cross-linking a lot in several of these cases uh, years ago. Um, but one of the, the challenges that we came across was uh, the lack of penetration of the, the riboflavin into the cornea, um, not getting in deep enough into the cornea. And corneal crosslinking is dependent upon the oxygen gradient that's created with the riboflavin as it travels through the cornea. And so if it can only get a quarter of the way through the cornea and we have a deep stromal uh, lesion that we're trying to treat, then um, that is not going to be effective. Uh, and so th th I'm only telling you that because that was uh, at the time point when I started to dabble a little bit more into photodynamic therapy using infracyanine green and endocyanine green. Um, that has uh, essentially become more effective for me and what I do. Um, and I have a lot of experience in using that. And so when I think now, should I use corneal cross-linking or should I use photodynamic therapy? Photodynamic therapy works for me. So I don't have, uh, I don't have a reason to go to corneal cross-linking. Um, but I also don't have enough experience with corneal cross-linking to know in which of these specific indications uh, it would be better, for example. So there's, there's a, a lot being done. Uh, with corneal cross-linking throughout the world, especially in, in Switzerland with Simon Pott and his group uh, and others as well, uh, and, and very promising um, uh, approaches to, to many different uh, corneal diseases. Um, and, and it doesn't, doesn't matter, right? I mean, if you have access to corneal cross-linking and you use it and you feel comfortable using it and it's effective, then, then use it. Okay, thank you for this, Richard. Uh, also, Verena uh, asked if you are using uh, coronal crosslinking for melting or infected coronal ulcers. I guess that's the same. You have no possibility of using it on. We we do. We we have we have a a, a peshke unit. Um, okay. We use it mainly in in small animal. We we've used that a couple of times in the horses, um, but m most of the time we we are are dealing with those with medical management and a combination of surgery and, and uh, photodynamic therapy with, uh, with uh, infracyanide green. Okay, then there is another question by Shanine. So um, she was seeing an opaque streak across the cornea arising from the surgical site in one of the post-surgery photo slides uh, you showed us mm -hmm. in the DLEK post-surgery yeah. photo slide. So she wanted to know if this is a decimate rupture and uh, what would it look like on OCT? Uh, so uh, that's good that you asked that. So it's not a rupture, it's a, a, a stretch. Um, there's tension on Desmase membrane. That's a, a Hobstria like we would see in a glaucomatous eye, uh, very similar. And I'm going to I'm going to pull up another presentation here. Just give me a second. So this is this is an example. This is not the same eye um, that uh, that you saw that in, but in the DLEKI, very similar. This is this is what it looked like here. So um, this is uh, Desmase membrane, and then there's a, essentially a step in Desmase membrane. There is a minimal amount of Desmase membrane in this part of the cornea. We see that histopathologically uh, a lot. Um, if there is a break in Desmase membrane, and this is where you can be fairly certain if you're dealing with a, a, a rupture of Desmase membrane versus a Hobstria or a, um, a stretching of Desmase membrane in that you won't see any edema. Um, there, there can be edema in the cornea 
that forms and then hopstria can develop out of that. I see that clinically in cases of glaucoma occasionally, but more often than not, these hopstria will just form. Um, what it is that causes them is still unclear, uh, but this is what they look like on OCT. Um, and you can see that there's a little bit of a break and then I got distracted with what's going on over here, uh, which is, this is just a hair uh, trapped in the, uh, in the precorneal tear film. Uh, but you can see there's just a little bit of a step and then there's some hypoechogenicity around the, uh, the thin layer of desmase that covers the stroma. So they generally don't require any further uh, intervention just monitoring, see if they change for uh, anything. I've never had um, a post-operative um, hobstria or separation of, of uh, um, a stretching of desmase that has led to any clinical, um, clinically relevant problem, aside from it being there um, and being visible. Okay, uh, Richard, we have two other questions. There um, is one question by Birgit. She was wondering how are you collecting or how would you recommend collecting amnion or is there a specific protocol we, you could recommend because uh, often commercial amnion is not really available and it's hard to work with. That's at least her experience. Yes. So we, we have the advantage of having a theriogenology service at the hospital. And so we usually get our amnion from uh, C-sections. Um, so we can take that amnion and then prepare it. And the protocol for preparation of amnion um, was, um, was uh, published by uh, University of Florida. Uh, Frank Olivier was the primary author in that paper and with Dennis Brooks's a group uh, at University of Florida in Gainesville in the early 2000s. Um, and that protocol is in uh, uh, equine ophthalmology uh, in the corneal chapter as well in, uh, in uh, that was edited by Dr. Gilder. Okay. That protocol cool. is in there. Okay, cool. Um, and then Margie, she wanted to know if you ever used the commercial prepared amnion product, did you see any difference? I, I haven't used it yet. So I have, um, I just received a, a sample recently of the newer one that has an adhesive with it. I'm kind of excited to try that, but I haven't used it yet. Um, we've, I've always had the luxury of being somewhere where I could get amnion without any problem. Um, and so we always have it. Okay, thank you. And then uh, last one, Brady. So Mr. Food, uh, so Brady, uh, he had a clinical case. Uh, he did surgery. Um, and that's a she. That's that's Brady Flip. Oh, sorry. I didn't oh. I didn't know that first name before, <laughs> but now that you say that, I know yeah, who that is. Okay, yeah. Brady. So Brady, she 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 did surgery. Um, she did surgery uh, and uh, did an excision with a CO two laser uh, and uh, were resecting sixty to seventy percent of the corneal surface. And this patient was sadly represented with a corneal rupture a, a week later. And she was wondering how she could have treated this case differently. And if there could have been a bad luck secondary infection process and uh, the owner elected inoculation in the end, declined any diagnostics. So she had no chance to um, see what was happening. And um, she was also wondering if the resection had any influence um, to the, the stem cells or the limbus, and this would con would contribute it contributed to the perforation. And did you encounter any similar things, or what's your thought about that? Well, I I, I can't say that I encountered that similarly. Um, I, I really never use a CO two laser to cut. The cornea. I, I know that people do, but I, I have I don't have experience doing that. But there's certainly with um, the CO2 laser, if you're using it to cut down that deep, um, you don't have a lot of tissue remaining on the underside of the, the squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and so with only 30% remaining 
you know, how accurate is that too? Maybe it was deeper in some places. So you get close to um, having very little stroma at the posterior aspect of your incision. Um, it certainly decreases the stability of the cornea. Um, and if there was no graft placed over the top of it, then it has to heal by second intention. And so you know, even if it's why it's re-epithelialized and there's not a lot of stromal tissue there to provide structural support. Um, I, 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 I don't know, I like to use a blade to remove squamous cell, put, do keratectomies, uh, either a 64 blade or a, a crescent knife or, or a Martinez corneal dissector. You don't have to go very deep at all, except in those uh, in, indications where you've got invasive squamous cell or or, you know, in some instances, we'll have um, a part of the squamous cell will appear to go deeper. Um, but after removing majority of the tissue superficially, you can go back into that focal area and take a smaller section that's deeper. Um, I, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't really know for sure what um, contributed to that. I, I would suspect that mm. the CO2 laser had a lot to okay. do with that. She just added that she was not using the CO2 laser to cut it. She was just using it adjunctively after um, the lamellar okay. keratectomy. So that oh, but it was that deep point. to begin with? Yeah, so she okay. just wrote it. Yeah. OK, because if it was if it was 70% depth and then you used the CO2. 30%, she said. Oh, 30. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that I don't know why she would have that then. Um, cause that, that's pretty much how, how that was described in the past, unless there was some secondary infection that, that caused a, a problem. I, cause that's what the CO2 laser ablation of the surface tissue that that's pretty standard for, uh, I think still for lots of places, uh, at this point. Okay. Then Pedro, he, um, was posing a question about, if you have any description how you perform surgery, like sedation or anesthesia, are there any lectures or recommendation where he could um, get answers for that? Uh, um, I, I guess probably the best place where it's described is in, in our paper on the um, on the uh, uh, Gailey KPL case under sedation um, and. The sedation is described in there as well. We, we use a, a butorphanol detomidine combination, um, uh, kind of equivolume um, of detomidine and butorphanol IV, and then we give a double uh, volume of butorphanol IM um, to help keep the horses stable for a longer period of time, uh, and then retrobulbar blocks and, and local eyelid blocks. But, um, yeah, I think that is well above what we can talk about right now. Okay. I'd be more than happy to answer questions that he has if he sends me an email um, after he kind of reviews the paper that I would be happy to do that. Okay, good. So no questions so far. Um, if anyone have still questions, please um, write me some and then uh, I think we are done. So um, thank you um, first for our vision for giving us the possibility to get in contact with our colleagues again and uh, for hosting this webinar. And uh, Richard, thank you very much for this um, really amazing lecture. It was fun <laughs> talking to yeah, you Yeah, thank again. you. That makes it go a lot smoother when you don't have to watch that yeah. question and answer box all by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, and, uh, and thank you um, all out of there for your attention um, and I wish you uh, a good night um, in India and in Europe and I wish you a good afternoon in the States and I hope to see and hear you all soon. Thank you Sylvia, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.